Great. Hello, everybody. Kelvin Chin here for our Overcoming Anxiety panel discussion today, July 27th, 2021. Great to have everybody on who's live here with us, and then uh, all of you who are watching the recording afterwards. Um, those of you who are live, I've put my contact info in the chat room box, but just real quick, I'll just say at the outset, you can Google my name. Uh, that's, that's a real easy way to find me, Kelvin Chin. Um, I think I'm the first three pages on Google uh, when, you, when you Google my name, but um, the website, I have four websites. So the website that's related to what we're gonna be talking today uh, is turningwithin.org, turningwithin.org. I also have an Overcoming the Fear of Death website, which is just the words, overcomingthefearofdeath.org. So either of those two websites are going to be relevant to our discussion today about overcoming anxiety. <clears throat> um, just so you know, you can go to the bottom of any page on any of my websites, and the, there are hot links to the other three uh, websites that I have. Okay. Um, so before we get into our panel discussion with our three panelists who, uh, who uh, have had uh, significant, let's say high anxiety in, in their past, and I've helped them with that. Let me just give, me, give you a, a, a brief uh, background on myself, like a two sentence summary, because some of you may never have heard me speak or haven't taken my classes before. Um, <clears throat> I've been meditating since I was 19 years old. I had high anxiety. That's why I learned to meditate. So some people will learn to meditate and they'll even take my meditation class because they, they don't have anxiety. They don't have anxiety issues or stress issues. They, I don't know, I teach athletes. They want to get back on the playing field faster and heal faster. I teach people who want to open up more spiritually to their, you know, open up their mind, their consciousness more, et cetera, for various reasons in that respect. But I learned because I was very high anxiety. I was in college at the time and I was literally in one word, I was desperate. And that's how, you know, why, how, how I tumbled into the world of meditation. It's not part of my culture, not part of my background at all. Um, yes, I'm Asian, but my parents were very scientifically oriented, et cetera. So not into anything meditation oriented at all. Um, and it obviously helped me. That's why I've been teaching meditation for 48 years now. So thousands of people, I taught the first meditation courses in the history of West Point, also in the US Army, all the army bases in Korea, PTSD, high anxiety, very stressful environment, so forth. Um, uh, on the DMZ, the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea, many times teaching meditation, et cetera. Um, we're talking about anxiety, you know, so that's enough about my background. You know, I have a lot of experience teaching and meditating and so forth. Uh, and I have a lot of experience with uh, various meditation techniques, which I'll talk about after we hear from the panelists. But, you know, Anxiety. Let's just talk very, very briefly about anxiety. I mean, I think we know what it is. <laughs> you know, we've all experienced it at some point feeling stressed out. Now, some of us may not feel as stressed out as others and may not define it or label it anxiety, but we've all been under pressure and feel, felt stress at times in life, right? And so I think just a simple uh, definition of anxiety is just being really stressed out. <laughs> I will just keep it simple. All right. But I did look it up on the Mayo Clinic <laughs> uh, website. And here are some common symptoms, anxiety symptoms, feeling nervous, restless, or tense, having a sense of impending danger, panic, or doom, having an increased heart rate, breathing rapidly, call that hyperventilation, sweating, trembling, feeling weak or tired, trouble concentrating, or thinking any, about anything other than the present worry at that moment, having trouble sleeping, uh, experiencing gastrointestinal, GI problems, digestive problems, it means, uh, having difficulty controlling worry, and having the urge to avoid things that trigger anxiety. So that's the list from the Mayo Clinic. And I think that 
uh, some of those things may resonate with you who have had anxiety and been diagnosed by doctors as having anxiety issues and so forth, or just by yourself as feeling very, very stressed out. Um, you know, I simply talk about it in terms of the fight or flight response. You know, what's the fight or flight response? That's when you either fight the saber toothed tiger at your cave door 200,000 years ago, or you run away from it. Uh, that's why they call it fight or flight. It's a term that came up uh, that this that the uh, scientists came up with in the 1970s because you know they like to label things so they call it the fight or flight response uh, the sympathetic nervous system is the medical term and that's when the heart rate increases and why does it do that that's to pump more blood to the big muscles and the shoulders and the arms so you can run away or you fight and it's a survival mechanism so the fight or flight gets a bad rap a lot and it's not a negative thing it is a an important survival mechanism that exists in every human nervous system. But the bad thing is that when all of that adrenaline and, and, and cortisol and lactic acid and this 40 to 60 other hormones and chemicals that pump through the system in order to save our lives, um, <clears throat> when that's turning on when you're in a long bank line or you're commuting in traffic or whatever, that's not a survival event. And so it should not be getting triggered at that point but we all have experienced this you know when I was in college you know walking into a calculus exam or a chemistry exam my fight or flight turned on big time let me tell you and so um, it's it, it it constricts the brain it causes you to focus in a in, in in a very tunnel way in order to focus and survive and 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 and, and run away from the tiger at your door that's not a great thing, to, state of mind to be in all the time. And that's the problem. When we have high anxiety, that fight or flight is getting triggered way too much, all right? Many sources of anxiety. Uh, you'll hear some of uh, the panelists today talk about uh, fear of death, but that's not the only source of anxiety. You can have uh, anxiety about anything. And I help people reduce their fears and anxiety about whatever the source is, does not matter. But I do have a special focus, those of you who don't know me, I do have a special focus helping people with overcoming the fear of death and related fears around death and dying. Um, and what's the goal of all of my work is to help people restore balance in their life so that you can really reclaim your life. And I hear this all the time from my higher anxiety students that some quote like this, I just want to get my life back. That's the very common quote that I hear. And so let's open it up to um, uh, several of my students here, and then we'll have Q&A, a live Q&A afterwards uh, at the end of our discussion here. Um, and uh, we'll start with Brittany, Brittany Cook. And uh, Brittany, why don't you share with us your story? And then, uh, you know, I may make some comments and so forth, but um, just share with everybody, you know, how you found me and, you know, what you went through. And I think we'll go through the panel that way. Okay, Brittany. Okay, hi, so I am Brittany. Um, I am the mother of four and I had my first baby when I was 20 years old. So um, of course, I don't think any first time parent knows what's really coming, but certainly not when you're 20. Um, and I definitely didn't expect all of the post postpartum sad feelings, the blues, postpartum depression, all of it. And it was my first real experience with anxiety and it was desperate and it was frightening. Um, and again, I was just a 20 year old girl, so I had no idea what to do. Um, and at the time I just went to the doctor, took some meds and waited for it to go away. <laughs> but of course it came back again and again after each one of my babies, the last, each time being worse than the next, the last time baby I had, um, I remember being just feeling so scared and not knowing of what, having moments where I had to lay down where I was busy needing to catch my breath. One time um, I stood up and looked in the mirror and my vision just totally went away for a second. Um, 
And I just felt this like, I don't know, this horrible paradox of a feeling of like holding this child in my arms and loving her so, so much and just feeling like doom or helplessness mixed in with that, this awful anxiety feeling. So I couldn't fully enjoy like the births of my children. So after I was done having babies, I thought, okay, well, maybe this isn't going to happen again, but that's not how it works. <laughs> and so every so often it would sneak back up on me and out of nowhere, life could be perfect. Life could be great. And I would be walking in the grocery store and I would just feel it. And I just knew it was coming. And when I say it was coming, like it doesn't necessarily mean an anxiety for me, an anxiety attack, but it was like, I knew that the underlying anxiety was coming to hang around for a while, days, maybe weeks, maybe months, and that there was most certainly be anxiety attacks and panic attacks involved at some point. So, um, you know, one time I was asleep in bed in the middle of the night and woke up with already already in the middle of just a very panicked, you know, trying to catch my breath. My heart was racing and I woke my husband up and he talked me through it. We calmed down or I calmed down. He, he helped me calm down. And um, I was just like, I can't do this anymore. This is so scary. It's stealing my joy. Anytime I felt happy, anytime I was playing with the kids, anytime life just seemed good, it would hit me. Like, it would be like, once I realized I was happy, there was just this feeling of doom that was really just this bubble of anxiousness, ball of anxiousness. So um, finally I got calmed down enough that I could relax a little and maybe fall back asleep. So I started looking on my phone, which you shouldn't do if you're trying to go back to sleep. And I was Googling, you know, help with anxiety and whatnot and um, came across Kelvin. And my husband and I called him the very next day and we talked to him the very next day on the phone. And I can remember asking him, am I going to be okay? And he said, you're going to be okay, Brittany. We're going to get you through this. And we, my husband and I both started meditating that week and we've never stopped. That's kind of it. <laughs> and, and how do you feel now? Why don't you tell, yeah, tell them a little bit about the, the, the journey after you learned. Yeah, so now I just, feel, I mean, I hate to say the word normal, but I, I, I feel more um, my normal. I can, I used to have to like, I felt like I was two different people in front of my kids. I used to put on this face, this mask. Sometimes you see commercials where they like hold up a mask to pretend they're okay and get the kids ready for school and get them to school. And then I remember just, and that's like only an hour and a half of my day. And I can remember them being gone and me finally just being like, <sighs> like, I don't have to hide it anymore. I don't have to cover up how I'm feeling for them. So they don't feel like something's wrong with mommy or mommy's upset. Um, and so just being able to be a mom to them and enjoy it and just function is, has, is just a total game changer instead of almost kind of like hiding from them who I really was when I was experiencing all that. And the same, I think with my relationship with my husband, I also felt like he was having to take care of me. And then I felt like a burden, you know, and now I feel like we're partners, we're teammates and like I can, like I can carry my load, my, my part of the load. Oh, that's great. That's great. And then you learned about how long ago? Do you remember? Was it was it 2018? I think I think it was. I think it was three years ago. Yeah. 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 That's great. That's great. And did it come and go still at that point? Or, or did it pretty much go away? And how, how, how was your, we'll call it trajectory in, in terms of when you learned? Do you remember? Because it was a while ago. I don't know if you remember. So for me, per, and you know, cause it's different with everybody for me personally, um, when I would hit peak anxiety, like that would be here to stay for a little while. When I introduced 
meditation into my life, I think it might've been, I mean, I think within a week I was feeling a lot better. Um, and then this is just me again. I definitely would get a bout of deep depression and anxiety at least once a year, it would sneak up on me. And it's been three years and knock on wood, <laughs> none of that has happened. No bouts of anything have snuck up on me. So I think it took me about a week to really feel the anxiety really shift and kind of that heaviness leave. Um, and then it, and then I just, and I feel like it has stayed in its place. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. That's good to hear. Yeah. Everybody's different. Like, like Brittany said, everybody's different and some people, um, it can go away. The anxiety can dissipate and go away very quickly. And I think you'll hear from some other, some of the others on the panel today, it may take some time and come and go and so forth. And that's totally normal. That's the thing. There's no one way that it is always is for everybody. That's the thing. So that's great, Brittany. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Um, and we'll come back and uh, people can ask Brittany questions and so forth later. Uh, and maybe if Brittany, even if you have something that you want to interject later, after we go through the other two folks, you know, feel free. Okay. If something pops up in your mind, like, oh, I should have mentioned this. Okay. Um, Jeremy, you want to tell us? Tell it, share your story with everybody. Yeah, absolutely, I do. Um, Brittany, great job. Um, it's really, really cool to hear your story. Um, yeah, so my name is Jeremy Taylor, um, and I met Kel about five years ago. Um, we've kind of been in, in contact on and off. Um, but so to, to tell you guys my story, my struggle with anxiety started when I was 14 years old. Um, I had a interesting childhood to say the least. Um, my parents were addicts and we just, there's just constant chaos in my, in my household and in my life from the time I was born, um, until the time I moved out. <clears throat> um, and even, even still there's, there's chaos there. My mom passed away and that's part of my story I'll share with you guys. But, um, I was kind of bred and conditioned to be anxious. Um, and I believe for me, at least, that's that's how I understand anxiety. Is it's a habit, um, and it's a habit that was that was formed and ingrained in me from from the time that I was born. It just manifested in my life what seemed like overnight. But as I kind of unpeel my story and look back at it, I realized that it had just built to a crescendo, and then that was the moment that I became aware of it. But I can easily look back through my life and and remember moments where it was there. It just didn't have a name or a face or anything. So, and because it came and went um, really rapidly, I didn't, and I was young, I didn't know what, what it was or anything. So I didn't think much of it. I just thought it was a scary thought or something like that. So uh, the first time I experienced real anxiety, I was sitting in a CPR class. I was 14 years old. Um, and I had what kind of felt like a drug flashback um, to be totally transparent. I had messed around with some, some drugs before that. And I thought, oh my God, I'm one of these stories where somebody has a flashback and it never goes away. Um, that was my initial thought. And um, I started panicking and freaking out and crying. And I left the CPR class. Um, my mom took me home. She didn't really know what to do uh, for obvious reasons. My parents weren't too in tune with how to help anything. And back then there was no internet. There was no books. I didn't have any support system. so. I dropped out of school. I pretty much locked myself in my bedroom for 10 months. I was a freshman in high school um, and I didn't leave my room, but to shower maybe once a week and eat. That was it. Um, it was, it was a rough time and I didn't really have anybody to, to support me. I didn't know anything about meditation. We went to the doctors and they did all the tests and I'm sure anybody that's had real anxiety, real bad anxiety, um, all anxiety is real, but real bad anxiety um, has been through that where you go to the doctors and they do all the tests and they tell you you're fine. And you're like, oh, shit, <laughs> there's nothing fine about it. Um, so went down the medication route back then. And for me, ultimately, I decided that I wasn't going to 
stay in that room forever. So my goal at one point was just to walk to the mailbox. Once I achieved that, it was to walk around the apartment complex. And then it was to go out to the movies with my friends. And over probably, I would say about a month, I ended up just getting enough courage to go back to school. But my anxiety was along with me the entire ride. I just powered through it. Um, I would just get to points where I was distracted enough that I didn't feel it, but it was never not there. Um, I didn't have on and off anxiety. I had anxiety pegged to 10 and I just wasn't willing to give up. Um, so medication didn't work for me at that time. So I got off of that and that was a bumpy road and went about my life and graduated high school and all that sort of thing. And then um, when I was 23, I decided that I didn't want to suffer anymore. So I went the Western medicine route again and, and got on some medication again and tried three or four antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications. And after a couple of years of that, I bailed on that again because it had really no effect um, on me. Um, and then kind of just powered through life for another five years or so, and then decided that I had a career and I was making good money and read some books about anxiety throughout this whole process of my life. I've always turned to books and, and education and that sort of thing to just try to understand it, if nothing else. Um, so then I went the farthest direction of Western medicine that I could find because I had um, the finances to do it. And I went to the Amen clinics and got brain scans and got all this stuff. And they proved to me why my brain was broken. You know, you look at this scan and they show you parts of your brain and they say, okay, this is where anxiety comes from. And we're going to magically make this red section turn to green and you won't ever feel it again. Well, fast forward a couple of years after that, um, their magic solution didn't work either. Um, I would confidently say that there, if there's 50 anxiety and depression medications on the market, I've tried 95% of them. Um, for me personally, none of them ever worked. Um, when I decided I was, so when I met Kel, my mom had, had passed away, unfortunately, right at the time, it's never a good time for one of your parents to pass away. But for me, my mom passed away right at the time that I was, um, I had a really bad experience getting off some medication with the Amen clinics and, and they didn't handle it very well. They, they had me drop off this medication instantly. And in hindsight, it probably should have been like a six month taper. So I was in a horrible place mentally. Um, you know, I had a family to support and my mom passed away and there's just a million things going on and I didn't know what else to do. So my anxiety, a lot of times in my life has manifested through a fear of death. So that's how I felt or that's how I found Kel. Um, so I reached out to him really for that because in my experience, my body will always look for, for a thought that creates anxiety. And the thought that for the most of my life, the thought that was always the trump card for my body to, to panic was death. So if there was any, at any point in time that my body wanted to feel that anxiety, all I had to do was think about death and we're right there to level 10 instantly. Um, so that's how I found out about Kel. And I was at a point where I had a job in, in the power line industry. Um, I was running crews, I was doing super stressful work and I would literally drive my car around the corner, cry my eyes out, meditate, drive back to work, like nothing happened. And I would do that several times a day for, for a couple months, just because I was kind of in that situation where that was all I could do. There was, there was no other option financially. And I know I've always just kind of been the guy to, to power through things. So anyways, um, once the medication withdrawals and stuff kind of leveled out, then I was able to really, I had started the meditation practice with Kel, but it was kind of like, you know, throwing a cup of water on a forest fire at that point. But I could feel that there was something there and I could feel that it helped, even if it just helped for a minute. And as I started to build that practice up and as that medication effects started to level out, um, I started to get real value out of meditation. And I started realizing that for me personally, the solution I ran out of options with Western medicine um, and the results I was seeing from meditation and, and introspection and journaling and some other things was the only solution that I had ever found. And for me, that was enough to just put all my efforts and all my energy into that. Um, and 
basically what that made me do was I decided that I was never going to put my anxiety in somebody else's hands. Um, medication works for some people and, and for some people it doesn't. And for me, it didn't. And I wasn't willing to say that that was the end of the road. Um, one of the quotes that sticks with me that I think about a lot is, um, I heard Will Smith say this actually of all people, but I don't think it's his quote, but I'll give him credit because it's where I heard it. But he said it, you know, your mental health, like the reason you are the way you are is he said, it's not your fault, but it is your responsibility. And that's what I live by to this day is my mental health is my responsibility. It doesn't matter whose fault it is. Um, the only person that can do anything about it is me. So I know that there's things that I do in my life that make me feel better. And I know when I'm not doing those things that it's my responsibility to do them. Um, otherwise I can't point the finger at anybody else. If my anxiety comes back, I know that it's typically because I'm not doing the things that I need to do to support myself. And I understand it. Um, and another big thing for me with anxiety and Kelvin, let me know if I'm out of time, but another big thing for me with my anxiety is just understanding my relationship with it. Um, your anxiety, your anxiety is an appropriate reaction to something that's happening that you're probably just not aware of. Um, or at least that's how it was for me. So understanding my relationship with that, like I do a lot of things, you know, in, in the power line industry, for instance, I've worked off of helicopters and on top of towers and stuff. And for somebody with panic attacks and anxiety, that's, that's a really strange thing to do. But I understand in my mind that the anxiety that I'm feeling in that situation is completely appropriate. So it's different than anxiety that I'm feeling if I'm sitting in a, in a park, having a panic attack for what seems like no reason. Right. So for me, it's really about following the breadcrumbs in my mind and figuring out where this anxiety is coming from because it's coming from somewhere. Um, and that's what meditation really allows me to do is, is look inside myself and figure out how I, where this is coming from. Because for me, once I can put a reason to it, then it's not scary anymore. It's not a random thing that's happening that I have no control over and I'm not helpless anymore. I can look at it and say, okay, I'm having this panic attack because of this reason. And now we have something to work with. Um, in business, you know, sometimes things happen where you, you stress out, but you stress out because of a reason. Um, so it's not this, it's not, it doesn't have the helpless feeling to it anymore. So um, basically that's, that's my story is, is taking responsibility for, for my anxiety and my relationship with it and understanding where it comes from and what I need to do personally to, to maintain it. Um, not being a victim in my mind, being, being a person who says, you know, this is the relationship that I have and, and getting comfortable with it. And meditation is the biggest part of that, of all the different things that I do to maintain my anxiety, nothing sticks longer and helps quicker than, than meditating. Um, it's not a cure-all. You don't meditate for X amount of days and your anxiety goes away and it never comes back. I think we live in a society where we're, where people that benefit financially from telling us we're broken do so. Um, you know, you watch the Super Bowl and all the ads that are on there are anxiety and depression and, and everything else. And you look around at our society and more people have that than have ever had it before. And I don't think those two things are unrelated. Um, so yeah, I don't want to go down the, the bashing medicine road too much because I do think that it works for some people just for me in my mind, I want to take responsibility of, of my emotions. And when I see results, I want to follow that as far as I can. Thanks, Jeremy. That's great. That's great. Uh, so, Jeremy, let me ask you a question. Um, <clears throat> do you remember? I mean, I know it was five years ago when we met, you know, uh, when you first reached out mm -hmm. to me right after your mom died. And I, my heart still goes out to you. It always goes out to Thank you for that. Um, but you, do you remember um, how your anxiety came and went perhaps over a period of time, it's that, 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 that issue, because very often that's, that, that is a very common pattern. I wonder if you could speak to that. Go ahead. Yeah. And, and, and to be honest, it still does, right? Like that's one of the things that I was, that I was touching on, but understanding where it's coming from for me is extremely valuable. If I'm not meditating and I start to feel anxious, my brain wants to tell me, meditating is BS. None of this stuff works. You still have anxiety. Now I'm a victim again. And nothing good comes from that for me personally. 
looking at it and saying, okay, when I was meditating, I felt really good. I'm not meditating right now. I don't feel really good. It's my responsibility to start meditating again, right? Like, so if I'm in moments in my life where, where it's really high stress and I need help, then I turn to the tools that I have that help me. Meditation is the biggest one of them. There's other things I do as well. But it, for me, it's, it's understanding that, that my body, in my opinion, is not broken. It's just if your body needs to release something and you don't give it a way to release it, it's going to find its own way to release it. And you can't, complain, you can't complain about the way that your body releases it if you're not willing to take charge of how it gets released. That's a great point. It's something that I've been saying for many, many, many years. Uh, control, <laughs> control what we can control and let go of what we can't control. So we cannot control the world around us. And I mean, I can't control, you know, what laws <laughs> my state legislators or you know, the congressman in DC, yeah. but do they affect me? Absolutely. Yes. So I can't control that, you know, but can I control the choices that I make? Like you're saying, can I control mm -hmm. the choices that I make? Do I meditate? Do I meditate regularly? Yeah. Do I, do I, do I, do I eat uh, good food? Yeah. Do I hydrate? Do I exercise? Yeah. I can control certain things in my life. So we, we the more we can, we take control over what we can control, then we really do feel more in control. And if we're doing stuff that's more balancing for ourselves, it all feeds itself. So that's, it's a, it's a great point. And the other point that you make, which is another good point, which I, I say to my students all the time, which is we think our anxiety goes away and it, and it may seem like it does completely go away, because I always say, there's a phrase I always use in my teaching, and those of you who have taken my classes, you've heard me say this a million times, as compared to what? Well, as compared to Kelvin Chin, when Kel if I, Kelvin Chin's talking about Kelvin Chin, as compared to Kelvin Chin at 19 years old, I have zero anxiety, zero compared to right. age 19, okay? But, but you know, does this still, this stuff still bother me from time to time? Yes, we don't become a robot. The issue is, are we consumed by it like we were before when we were in a high anxiety state? No, that's the issue. And to me, that's contentment. That's no anxiety. Do I still get bothered by stuff? Look, if Jeremy and I were sitting in my car and I'm driving, I'm a, I'm, he's the passenger and <laughs> I'm driving the car, he would hear me cuss sometimes when I'm driving in traffic. <laughs> Somebody cuts me off and does some bonehead move and almost creates an accident for me and 10 other cars or whatever. I'm going to blurt something out. So, yeah. So if you were measuring me and I was wired up to machines at that moment, would you see a spike in my cortisol and my adrenaline? Yes, of course. But the issue is, am I scarred by that experience? No. Do I carry that around with me for the rest of the day or even five minutes later? No, that's the issue, okay? So that, that's where the rubber meets the road to me. That's what I refer to as overcoming anxiety. I sometimes will use the word eliminate, but I tend to stay away from that word because I don't like to use absolutes because it's yeah. as compared to what I say. And that's what Jeremy's kind of referring to. It's as compared to what? What's it relative to? And if we have, as he said, a different relationship with how we're experiencing life, that also shifts. It shifts the weight, you know, W-E-I-G-H-T, the weight of whatever that experience is or whatever it is that we're going through has on us it's no longer consuming us that's that's the issue that's the key um but thank you for that um thank you yeah walker uh yeah i you know i relate so much to what's been said so far um including what you just said kel about uh not being a robot because for me, I feel particularly invested in not becoming emotionless or even anxietyless, uh, because that's who it's it's who I am uh, ultimately. So, um, 
a little bit about me. I'm uh, my name is Walker Vreeland, and m- my life has been a, 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 just a shitstorm of anxiety from from day one. But I, I would not have it any other way. I wouldn't change a thing if I could, because uh, again, as a it it it, it is what feeds me uh creatively it what it's what makes me the the uh sensitive person and artist that i am and it's allowed me to connect with other people which is positive and it's led me here and and it has led me to finding tools and ways to to um to manage these these issues that do become completely overwhelming and all consuming i think that's such a such a good point because when it becomes all consuming that is when you can't function at your optimal level as a human being so um so a little bit about my story i started dealing with some pretty serious mental illness issues from a young age from at about 10 years old um, I told my parents I wanted to kill myself and um, and that I needed to see a mental health professional. I was very precocious. I knew exactly, I mean, I was really fucked up, but I knew what I needed. And so, and I was not afraid to ask for what I needed. So I told my my parents, look, I need to, you need to, you need to find me a psychiatrist or somebody to talk to. And um you know, it, it was it was an issue all through my youth and culminated in my mid 20s with a pretty major nervous breakdown. Uh, and that was caused, I would say, if I had to, you know, label what caused it, it's still uh, n- not entirely black and white, but I would say that it was the the primary issues were uh just a, f- a floundering sense of self and uh combined with the fact that i was w- majorly over medicated uh and that i had always looked outside of myself for the answer i had always sort of trusted in western medicine i had always gone to doctors i had always thought medication was the answer hoped that it would be the answer and uh, you know, if you're on, if you're taking so much medication, eventually you kind of lose yourself somewhere in there. You can't, you can no longer really tell what what is what is your baseline, what is normal. Um, everything just becomes a, a cloud of of chaos. So the scenario would be in terms of my anxiety, um, become anxious, reach for a pill not be anxious, get up the next day, maybe feeling like, okay, I may not be anxious today, but what if I get anxious? I better have those drugs on me. So you start to get anxious about your anxiety. It, it, it in the end, compounds the anxiety problem. So uh, that's what my big problem was, is kind of similar to what you were saying, Jeremy, about the, you know, finding finding the tools in yourself taking responsibility for these issues yourself um that was really big for me because my whole life i just reached for reached for something outside of me and so eventually thankfully i got off all of this medication one drug at a time and i discovered that that you know the the anti anxiety meds were were a real double-edged sword they they uh are a temporary fix but they do not solve the problem long term because it just creates this cycle of dependency on something external which is very disempowering and i think makes the anxiety worse so i had stopped taking medication by the time i met kel and and found him and I, at that time, had it, that had helped that I was no longer on it because that it, in a way, it empowered me that, you know what, I can handle this. Not that there won't be anxiety. It will come, but I will, I, I will just be able to handle it. I'll cope with it. And that, in a way, made me somewhat length, less anxious. And that was okay. Like that, All of that was enough until it wasn't. Uh, until uh, age 
37, um, about five years ago when I was diagnosed with cancer. And it was a very rare form of cancer, uh, a bile duct cancer. And I had um, the, the treatment was, you know, no chemo, no radiation, but major, major surgery. So I had to have three quarters of my liver removed. Um, and I did that and I survived it. It was probably the most traumatic thing I've ever been through physically. Um, and, 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 I'm, and I'm doing well and I'm cancer free, but you know, anyone who has ever been through a, a major illness like that knows that remission is not the end in, in, in many ways is just the beginning. And so, you know, it's great to be healthy, but mentally you're left with a lot of trauma and baggage that you, you, you have to deal with, uh, whether you want to or not major fear, major constant anxiety and paranoia about what was going on inside of me that I didn't know about and that the doctors didn't know about. Every little pain, every little abdominal twinge, whether it was familiar or unfamiliar, convinced me that I was dying and that nobody knew it. And so I would want to, I remember just wanting to fast forward to my next scan so I could just know now what was the truth about what was going on inside of me. So if my next scan was four months away, I had to deal with four months and just wanted to fast forward four months to that scan so I could know now. It was just constantly feeling like this need to control it as if that would make it any better. Um, the anxiety was different than the, the this health anxiety, health-related anxiety was different than, than anxiety that I dealt with before. It was more depressive. Um, whereas when I was in my 20s, I was, you know, running through the streets of New York City hysterically crying like a maniac um this this was more depressive and i would just and it ultimately stemmed from a deep fear of of my own death and just not wanting to die i'm not ready to die I don't want to die young i don't want to be one of the people that dies young so i remember my partner evan saying to me this has gotten really bad I've never seen you like this before. And I was basically face down on the bed at the time. And that was the moment that I realized, okay, I got to, something has to change here. I got to do something. I have to find a way to manage these feelings. And uh, I think I Googled managing fear of death at like two in the morning, found Kel and um, started working with him, started meditating. And I'll just, wrap it up my story by saying that what what changed what i noticed was that the comp i i had confidence that i had the tools internally to deal with the problem and that just the way that getting off medication made me somewhat le less anxious knowing i had the tools and knowing i had the agency to deal with these propensities of these anxious feelings helped g gave me the confidence and the confidence. It's like this, this, this uh, self-fulfilling prophecy, this snowball effect. It's like that gave me more confidence, which then in turn made me less anxious, which made me more confident, which made me less anxious. And then the second thing I noticed was the idea of death became less of a big deal. I don't know how else to explain it. I don't know how it happened in my brain, but it did. All of a sudden, it, it didn't, uh, wasn't all of a sudden, it was maybe, I started to notice a difference two to three weeks after meditating. And then it just continued. And what, what, what was different was, I thought, huh, I, oh, well. I can't, you know, I, it, it wasn't so much that I, it, it, that I, I didn't care about death. It was just that anything ultimately outside of my control, I stopped obsessing about. So over time, my attitude became, eh, 
what the hell can I do about it? Um, still went to the doctor, still took care of my health, but that's where I am now. What the hell can I do about it? There's, there are things I can control. There are things that I can't. One thing I can control, like Jeremy said, is I can meditate. So that's, that's my story in a nutshell. <laughs> Thank you, Walker. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, the, the fear of death to me, because I've helped in, helping people for so many decades with fear of death, and you guys have heard me say this before, which is it really distills down to the fear of uncertainty. And, and it really, there's, there's an uncertainty to life all the time. It doesn't matter. It's not just about death. It's about, uh, you know, I go to Trader Joe's and sometimes other people like whole raw cashews a lot. And so that they're all out of them. And it kind of annoys me, pisses me off. It's like, okay, great. Now I got to go to another whole, another, another Trader Joe's to get whole raw cashews. It's like, ah, come on, you know, but you know, do, am I petrified by that? Does that, does that cause me anxiety? No, it just annoys me. Like we said earlier, the example I gave with Jeremy driving in the car with me, it annoys me really, but I'm not scarred by it. That's the thing. And so essentially what the meditation does, that way I teach it, it does two things to get rid of the fear. It doesn't get rid of uncertainties. I tell people, I still don't know if they're going to have whole raw cashews or whatever. <laughs> Trader Joe's. That the issue is getting rid of the fears in life. Not on, we live in an uncertain universe. I mean, that's just the way life is, okay? Call a spade a spade, that's it. But how can we live with it without the fear and the anxiety? And so basically, two-pronged approach through the meditation process that I teach is it balances out the cortisol, the lactic acid, and the adrenaline, and all the, mis, the, the, the imbalance stuff that's in our brain and our blood chemistry. That's why the psychiatrists give the medicine, the psychotropic drugs, is because they recognize that there's a chemical imbalance in the brain chemistry. And they're trying to whack it with like a sledgehammer. And okay, I get it. That's the approach. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a therapist. So I always say that right up front to people. But, you know, and, and for, like Jeremy said, for some people, it may work. Okay. And I'm not saying not to take your medication and so forth. I'm saying you got to talk to your doctor about that. But there are side effects, and you know that. And there are side effects, and as Jeremy and, and, and Walker have outlined, they don't, they don't take care of the underlying cause. That's the issue. And so the imbalance in the brain chemistry is part of the issue that's influencing our mind and emotions. And the other is our mind itself. And Jeremy kind of touched on this a little bit. It's our mind itself, and the analogy I use uh, in my in my in my classes is the is the analogy of a huge football stadium. In, in, I call it the Houston Astrodome analogy because the professor, the psychology professor that I have borrowed this from decades ago, talked about he was at the University of Houston, so he spoke about the Houston Astrodome analogy. But imagine any huge, big football stadium or you know stadium in your in your country, and um, and imagine it empty at night and you're alone in it and all you can see is way down on the football field or the middle of the field uh the playing field is this little eight inch or 16 centimeter plastic bucket with about 10 ping pong balls bouncing in and out of it and the 10 ping pong balls are like your thoughts and emotions and that's and so that you know and, but the, the professor said to these graduate students at then at the university of houston he said no, no, he said, you think that's your mind. That's not your mind. Your mind is huge. It's vast. It's much bigger than you can, you, you, you can turn on the light switches in the rest of your mind if you want to. You know, he didn't know how to do that. That's what I teach people how to, that's, the, that's what the technique does. But the professor left it there and I've expanded the analogy to say that's what I, that's what, that's what I teach does. It turns on the light switches in the rest of your mind. What does that do? <clears throat> they start to realize that your mind is not this limited little eight inch or 16 centimeter bucket, that it's much bigger. And that, oh, my mind is more powerful. I can actually control more than I thought I could control. <laughs> I feel better. My self-confidence improves. Uh, anxiety starts to dissipate. So it's not an, a black and white, all or nothing thing. It's a gradual progression and it's an as compared to what thing, like I said earlier, and as compared to before, 
I don't have anxiety anymore because my mind, my mind, this is the explanation that I give my students, my mind has expanded its capacity for experience. So my relationship with my anxiety or with any experience I have has changed, it's shifted so that I'm my, who I am, the experiencer of all those experiences is much more firmly established within myself. The psychological effect is my anxiety dissipates. That's the issue. That's, that's the key, okay? <clears throat> but you can't do it by controlling the mind. So I'm curious if you guys have, could just speak to this last point of, um, I know some of you have done, tried other techniques and so forth, and how what I teach is different from other techniques out there, not just meditation in general. I don't know if you want to talk to that, uh, Walker. I know you've had experience in you when we've talked before on your interview podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I will just say that it because you made it such a cornerstone of the technique that you teach, this idea of ease. Um, that I, you know, I realized that, wow, God, I was really complicating it before. Uh, so there, there was this kind of realization working with you and this technique of how simple and also how, how uh, it's hard to explain how much uh i guess i could allow for more possibility just more more openness i guess that that that's how i think of it i mean even in terms of the way that i've evolved with this particular meditation when i started i remember being really kind of um contracted and and uh, obsessive about oh am i thinking the sound uh, the right way i mean i even because i'm a m musician i thought that oh it'd have to be the same pitch and the sound i mean all of this stuff that it was just like layering onto it and the more i do it um the 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 op the more open the whole process gets to to be whatever it is does that make does that make any sense? Yeah, it totally makes sense. That's it. That's what I, I tell people. It's about letting go. Uh, I'll get yeah, Jeremy and uh, Brittany comment on this too. Um, it's about letting go. That's it. But it's very common for my beginning students. When you're a beginning with me, even it, you know, people are trying to do the technique. They want to make sure they're doing it right and so forth and so on and, and all of that. And it's very common. And as you get more familiar with it, you realize. That no need to focus, no need to control, no need to concentrate, no need to clear the mind of thoughts, none of that in this technique. And that actually makes the technique work even better, even easier, more fit, more effectively. Jeremy, you want to comment? And then Brittany? Yeah, I think what um, Walker said that that was in line with what I was thinking is like, for me, a lot of my anxiety comes from my need to control. Um, and Kelvin's way of meditating when when I was when I was working with him and he would come in and out of the meditation, what I got out of that that I'm almost just now realizing is letting go of the fact that I was trying to control myself, not controlling. I don't know if that makes sense, but telling myself like i'm I'm trying to control the situation so much that I'm saying, you can't be controlling this situation right now, right? And that's my body, that's my instinct saying, you even have to be in control of the fact that you're not in control, right? So like, like it, but that is, that's just my brain being creative and finding a way to stay in control because I'm so scared to let the control go. And for me, like when my anxiety is really bad, I will, I will have panic attacks within like 20 seconds of falling asleep and I don't know if this happens to anybody else that has anxiety, but my brain is so scared to let go of control that the act of falling asleep puts me in a panic sometimes because I'm, because I'm not doing the things that I need to do, right? So my brain is like, holy shit, we're not in control anymore. Wake up and my heart is racing and I'm freaking out. And it's like, so, so meditating 
I saw Brittany had me laughing. She's like, oh my God, that happens. <laughs> um, the, the fear of death for me is about control. It's about what's happening in the world when I'm not here. Not that I, you know, and when I think about it from a zooming out level, like Kelvin's saying, I'm like, it doesn't matter. Like there's things happening in the forest in Amazon right now that I can't control either. Like it's things are happening. They always will be happening. And I have to accept it. I have to go with the flow of, of life, so to speak. Um, so for me, it, it's, it's control. I used to think about outer space and I would have the same panic attack that I have thinking about death because living forever scared me as much as living in a finite sense because I couldn't control it. Right. So all these things to me came back to, to control. So meditating, all that control stuff is either in the past or it's in the future. Meditating brings you into the present. When you're in the present, unless there's a bear or an intruder or something happening in your world, th those, those anxiety feelings are not appropriate. And if you can put yourself in the present as, like as, as drilled down as possible, you realize that and they, they're not there anymore because your brain is like, okay, we're safe right now. We have food, we have shelter, we have water, we're safe. Ah, when you start thinking about what's going to happen in my next business deal or what's going to happen when my daughter moves out of the house or what's going to happen, the farther you go into the future, you know, I really resonated with, or I really related with what Walker said about wanting that, that test like now, because I can't, I can't control the next four weeks and I can't, I can't wrap my head around waiting that long and because he's living, he's trying to live in the future. Right. And, and for me, most of my stuff like that is trying to live in the past. But when I, when COVID hit, I noticed everybody around me, all these super powerful, super happy, super successful guys all instantly turn into me, right? They were all in my shoes for a little while. And what I talked to them about was you're trying to live in the future and you, there's no way to control the future. Even if you grab it as tight as you can, none of that's going to happen. It's going to happen in a completely different way. So you just have to let it go. And the way you naturally let it go is by meditating and being in the moment that you're in. That's the thing. The key is because lots of people and there's lots of workshops and books and YouTubes and you guys and I have had conversations privately about this. There's a, tons of people saying this. The issue is how do you live it? How do you experience it? Because like you just said, you articulated so well, Jeremy, that the controlling not to control is still controlling. Trying, to, <laughs> trying. It's still trying. Yeah. And so like trying to be in the present is not being in the present. Or thinking that you're in the present is not even being in the present. Being in the present, that's why the phrase is being. It's being, it's not thinking in the present. Oh, it, the advice that people give you is don't, is, they're not saying you need to think in the present. No, you're always thinking in the present. You need to be in the present fully. And that's the thing. And how do you do that? It has to be experientially, it's got to be spontaneous. That's the missing link is the meditation is the missing link, not the content, not the intellectual understanding that we all need to be in the present. Everybody goes that. OK, you know, not everybody, but most people have talked about that. But the issue is living, living that, being that. And so the, the meditation in this non-content oriented, non-focusing, non-controlling way that I teach, that's what that's that's where the distinction is between the way I teach this and quite frankly, 99% of the other meditation techniques out there. Brittany, you want to comment on this or anything else? <laughs> sure. No, I actually forgot to mention uh, um, as part of my story, there was a, a time when my, before Kelvin, when my uh, anxiety got so bad and depression that I went away, I voluntarily checked into a 30 day rehab facility to treat my depression and anxiety. And so of course there was, there was psychiatric care and talk therapy and group therapy, but there was lots of holistic um, alternatives available. I would say it was actually mostly holistic, um, which is where I found the most benefit. And part of that was meditation, but I have to say, I remember like trying to learn and just being like, well, first of all, my brain is always like, am I doing it right? Am I doing it right? If I'm not doing it right, is it really working? And one of our leaders one day said, listen to the birds. Now listen to the people walking over there. <laughs> like, and so of what meditation actually was, it was like, close your eyes and just listen and be, and it, I had no clue. 
So um, I was always overthinking it, but I think now one of the biggest things for me is not overthinking it. And um, I don't know, it just kind of made it so much more clear and so much more easy. And also for me as a mom with four kids who are running around everywhere, it's so much more accessible to do. Like, I don't feel like I need to be, you know, in a quiet room with my legs crossed, like doing it all perfectly. I feel like I can do it in my car as soon as I drop my kids off at school, like right before I get go into the grocery store. Um, so it took a lot, I felt like it took away a lot of the guesswork that I was doing in my brain when I was like trying to do it before, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah, it totally makes sense. Totally makes sense. And 10 to 15 minutes twice a day, as you guys know, you don't have to do it a long time. If the technique is effective, you don't have to be doing it a half an hour, hour, two hours, like some of these other techniques. If the technique is easy, it's going to be more effective because think about it logically. We are turning on an automatic switch. The parasympathetic is the opposite of the sympathetic in the nervous system. It's the medical term. The parasympathetic is the medical term for the healing mode of the nervous system or the opposite of the fight or flight switch. So e equally automatic is automatic as the fight or flight is the opposite is equally automatic. You cannot turn on an automatic switch by controlling to turn on an automatic switch. It just makes no logical sense. It's antithetical, right? No logical sense. You can't control something to, to make something automatically go on. Otherwise, it's not automatic. Well, the easier the technique, the more effortless, in other words, the less effort, the less controlling, the faster you turn on an automatic switch. And that's, and that's why you only have to do this technique 10, 15 minutes each time, twice a day. That's it. Because it turns on the parasympathetic so quickly. And in the experiments that some of you know that I was a test subject in the very first medical studies done in the US on meditation in 1970, 71, 72, and um, published in Journal American Medical Association and cover story Scientific American Magazine at the time in 72, I think February. And um, they saw the cortisol level, lactic acid, I can't remember where else they were measuring, just plummet immediately. Now, when I'm sitting there meditating, do I notice my cortisol level? Change? No, I'm sitting there thinking about rock and roll back when I was 19 years old, you know, I'm <laughs> thinking about whatever, you know, but my cortisol level shifted. And that's really what triggers the positive reduction in my anxiety from a chemistry standpoint you know, right away. So, but it's, but it's all about not controlling. That's, that's the key is, as, 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 as uh, the three of, of our, our panelists here just said, it's about not controlling. You can't control <laughs> to control and you can't control an automatic switch. No, it's otherwise not automatic. That's the key. Okay. Um, so why don't we open up to questions and see uh, other folks. I'm going to take myself off of speaker view and put it on gallery. So folks have questions and so forth uh, for me or any other panelists, feel free, speak up. <clears throat> Kelvin, could I ask a question? Yes, Donna, yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask Walker and Jeremy, because um, I've got really intense fear of death and aging and it's, I just find it absolutely overwhelming at the moment. Um, how long would you say it kind of took you for you, with your meditations before that, before you kind of noticed that it was, that fear was abating and, and how did it, I just can't kind of imagine myself not having that fear and um, because it has just kind of overtaken my life really. And um, I just wondered kind of, I don't know how it kind of came about. I've been meditating with Kelvin now for about a month. And sometimes when I meditate, it kind of brings on the anxiety. Um, I've been off work now for a couple of months as well. And I just, as Kelvin said at the beginning, I just desperately want my life back. Um, yeah, I just kind of wondered how, how it had kind of panned out for you. I mean, I know everybody's different and I'm kind of looking for that magical... When will it happen? When will it happen? Kind of thing. But um, kind of how it happened, I've got this like intense fear of aging as well. I'm 46. And um, it kind of stems from, I'll keep a very long story short. When I was 10, um, I was taught a prayer about death. And um, 
I really kind of thought about it and just hit me massively um, about, you know, one day I wouldn't exist and it's a whole sort of existential thing and, you know, what would happen if I don't exist anymore and all that kind of thing. Um, I just wondered how that kind of eased for you two, that fear of death, which is so strong. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Um... Hmm. So for me, it was like, um, it felt almost chemical. I, I don't know if that makes sense. It was, uh, it, it took maybe three, three to four weeks for me to start noticing a, a shift in my, just my attitude towards the idea of death but again it wasn't so much death it was more what i can't control okay what i don't have control over and then it was almost like once i got a glimpse of that yeah it um i was like ooh what what's this and and then the it it continued to be fed it was like that point of view that perspective that attitude towards what i can't control um when i got a glimpse of it it kind of excited me mm. and then that 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 almost seemed like that caused it to grow right yeah and then the more it grew the more i was like oh this is kind of cool this kind of like whatever kind of attitude <laughs> yeah. and uh yeah so that's 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 how it was for me and i i really get what you're saying also about aging i um you see aging you. sucks um yeah. <laughs> and and um yeah so I, I, anyway i i don't know if that's helpful but that was just my my experience with it okay thank you yeah jeremy you want to comment I, yeah i was just taking some notes so i can try to stay on track i struggle with that yeah that's okay let me make a comment here before while you're making some notes so the aging okay, i'm thing, good now but it's okay. the the aging thing uh first of all we're all aging physically, biologically, our bodies are aging, okay? It's just as soon as you're born, it's aging. <laughs> That's the reality. Um, but let me make a comment about a study that was done in the 1990s. So it's relative to the studies that I was in in 1970s, it's more recent, it's still 30 years ago. But in the 1990s at Harvard Medical School, they did a study on this technique that I, that I teach you guys. And they noticed on the average, and the people were, on the average of uh, four years doing this technique. So three to five years. So we'll use four years as the average. The, the calendar age versus the phys physiologic age, their physical age was 12 years younger than their calendar age. So somebody who was 40 years old had a 28, had 28 year old markers in terms of their physiology just after doing this technique for four years. So that gives you some hope in terms of keeping your biological body younger than what however old your eight your eight, your calendar age says you are okay and that's after th you know four years of meditating i've been meditating 51 years and most people can't tell um you know i'm on the 71 year old side of 70 you know and most people can't tell that i'm almost 71 years old all right so there's there's that element too but jeremy speak to your from your experience to, to donna go ahead yeah don i can relate with with what you said so much um when i first talked to cal i was i remember having a conversation in him and i don't want this to come out wrong so hopefully it doesn't but i remember kelvin giving me some of his thoughts on death and i just kept thinking in my mind but yeah you don't understand because you haven't felt it you know what i mean like you haven't you haven't lived the thought that instantly makes your heart go whoosh yeah yeah and every time you go back to it it goes whoosh whoosh yeah. whoosh and the more you go back to it the worse it gets right yeah. and i was like 
the only reason that I, that I am so passionate about trying to help other people with this is because I've felt that. Right. Yeah. So Walker hit the nail on the head earlier when he said, I don't know when it went away. I believe that's what he said. So hopefully I'm not yeah. misquoting him, but like, it was like, you just think about it one day and you're like, Oh, that doesn't scare me anymore. But on the road to that doesn't scare me anymore. It's, Oh, that doesn't scare me as much. Right. So it's like, the thing is, is, you know, I don't want to get off on a tangent on other things, but I don't know if, if, if you believe in like the law of attraction or any yeah. sort of religion or anything like that, but most people use the law of attraction in, in terms of like wealth and like what you can manifest into your life. Right. Like I look at it and I say, the, the, the concept is that what you, what you focus on expands. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're focusing on anxiety and your fear of death constantly, yes. yeah, it expands. Right. So if you, so for me, one of the biggest things for me was when I have a moment where I think, Oh, that, that was 10% less scary than it was last time. That's what I focus on. That's what I celebrate. That's what I want to expand. Right. I can't, if I sat here right now and I meditated and thought about death for long enough, it would scare the living hell out of me. Right. But it just, but it just doesn't affect my life. Like, because my body is going to find a way to get me into that state of anxiety because my, my body is addicted to that. I've lived yeah. with that for so long. Yeah. That addiction is just 95% less than what it was. So if I think about death in a casual part of the day, it doesn't bother me at all because I'm not hyper-focused on it. I'm not allowing that thought to get bigger and bigger in my mind. And I, I think exploring with yourself, if I can't tell you how you think, but I've heard every person on this panel and, and most people that I talk to outside of it you come to a realization that the fear of death is more a fear of not controlling. And I think if you, if you explore that thought in your mind a little bit, it kind of breaks you free of that ownership of this is who I am. And this is my thought and, and nobody else can understand it. And, and all that ownership of it. Um, and another thing is like death is going to come someday. Right. And that thought would terrify me before, because I'd be like, don't say that. That's what I'm scared of. Like, yeah. why would you say that? Right. Like, But I've kind of made a deal with myself that if I'm going to worry about it, then I'm going to worry about it when I need to worry about it. Mm -hmm. Right. It, it's not going to serve me at all to worry, to, to go down this road and explore all these things because I have no control over it. So how about I cross that bridge when I get there? Mm -hmm. Right. And if something tragic happens and I'm gone instantly, then I never had to worry about it. And ha ha ha, F you anxiety. You didn't get me right. I tricked you because I told you I was going to worry about you one day and that day never came. So I went right. Like, I don't know. That's just kind of a, a thought that goes through my head is like, I don't need to worry about the future until it's here. As long as I stay in the present and I stay grateful for, for what I have in this moment, then I don't need to cross that bridge until that bridge comes. And if it comes, it comes. Right. But so I don't know if that, um, if that helps or not. Um, yeah. Another thing for me, Another sorry. thing for me is, yeah, sorry to I'm cutting you off, but another thing for me is I believe through research that I've done and just exploring myself that, that anxiety and those thoughts, I look at them the opposite way. I don't look at it like I had anxiety because I'm afraid of death. I look at it as my brain uses that thought because it wants the anxiety to come. Right. So my, so like if I break the, I don't know if you've ever had this, but I, I'll have something that like will trigger my anxiety for a certain period of time. And then I'll kind of get over it. Like sometimes my heart will do something strange. And then I go to the doctor and they do all these tests and they're like, no, your heart's fine. So then I'm like, I'm good. And then I don't stress about it for a while. And then five years down the road, I'm like, oh, it's, but it's doing something different this time. Even though I got that test that said that I'm like, but this one's a little different. So now I'm stressed about that. And I got to go into the doctor and they do again. They're like, no, you're still fine. And I'm like, oh, good. Right. So my brain is constantly seeking out these things that give it what it wants, yeah. which is that like, because your emotional relationship with your anxiety is completely separate from your body's relationship with your anxiety. Mm. Your body is enjoying that anxiety. Your body is like, man, I'm thinking faster. I can move quicker. I'm breathing fast. Like, so your body is like, what do I got to do to get some more of that? Well, every time I turn this death thought on, I get a fucking 
major pump of it. So let's just keep thinking about that, right? So it's it's kind of understanding that relationship and then staying in the moment and celebrating those moments when the anxiety goes away. What, like One of the biggest moments in my life that I still celebrate to this day is I was sitting meditating and I opened my eyes and I was like, holy shit, I'm not anxious right now. Right. Doesn't matter if I'm anxious tomorrow. Doesn't matter that I was anxious yesterday. Like in this moment right now, I'm not anxious. And I, I couldn't think of a time in my life from the time I was 14 to the time I was 37, I think when that happened, that I had a zero anxiety baseline. Even when my daughter was born, like I was anxious, right? Like there's always a moment of it. So I celebrate that and I say, okay, I did it once. I just got to get that to grow. I got to get that moment to turn into 10, mo 10 minutes and 10 hours and 10 days and 10 months, right? So celebrate and focus on, the, on when it is working and understand that it, if it's going to come back in the future, worry about that when it comes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So well, you, stay, stay in the moment. Good. A couple of points on this. So to reinforce a couple points, you'll hear me say this sometimes. <clears throat> that which we give, give our attention to grows stronger in our life. That which we give our attention to grows stronger in our life. It's a fundamental principle of the human mind. Whether you're meditating or not meditating, doesn't matter. So that <laughs> kind of sums up one of the points that Jeremy made. The other point that you hear me say a lot. We are not our thoughts and emotions. And look, I, I, have, I think about death and dying all the time. I help people with overcoming the fear of death and dying. Do I have anxieties about that? No. So it's not the thought, it's not the thoughts about death and dying that are the problem. They are triggered and associated with anxiety in some people, but I talk about it all the time. And so my students get to a place where they can also talk about death and dying and not be triggered and have anxiety from it. And that's, and that's, that's, the, that's the evidence that they're not the same. <clears throat> now, when you're in the middle of it, the anxiety, it's a soup and it does seem like it is the same. But the first step is the recognition that Jeremy's pointing out that they're not the same. And then, if, then when you start to have experience that supports that, that's the, that which we give, it, give our attention to grow stronger. Now, I'm not suggesting that during your meditation that you focus on that. But outside your meditation, yeah, we shift our attention to what makes us happier, let's just say, less anxious, or whatever phrase you want to use. That's the thing. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, oh, good. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, this is Cindy. I'm on my boyfriend's uh, Zoom. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, isn't meditation uh, or this, this tool that you use and I have found helps you be more of an observer of your thoughts? Uh, uh, it kind of gives a little space and separation because usually I'd have a thought and all of a sudden my emotions would go crazy and I'd get anxious. But uh, the uh, meditation helps you have a little bit of space, you notice your thought and you and then you realize that you are not the thought. Right. Uh, it yeah. helps you have some separation, uh, which lets, you know, you let the thought float away and you don't get in that spiral going down the rabbit hole. Exactly, that so th that's, that's why you'll hear me say often, like I've already said earlier, content of our thoughts during our meditation, we don't care what, because if you do, then you're, that which you give your attention to grows stronger. You are attaching yourself, in a sense, to use your language, Cindy, with with the content of your with the thoughts. So we don't in this technique. We don't care what our thoughts. It's okay, it's okay. We then we we have a specific specific instruction in the technique, right? Absolutely. And the other thing is the other reason that what Cindy's referring to as this quote unquote separation, um, uh, this this noticing you could call it or separation or whatever you want to call that experience happens is because of that eight inch plastic bucket the 16 centimeter plastic bucket idea of allowing the mind to expand its conscious capacity or experience outside of the bucket and that automatically without any content without mental manipulation at all it automatically brings about these this 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 these experiences that walker and jeremy are grasping words to try to articulate around it's difficult to articulate this because it's it's abstract but it's very concrete in terms of our experience and that's all what we really care about 
Brittany, you want to say something about this too? Because I know you were, <clears throat> you've had some issues with death and dying also. So you want to share? <clears throat> um, I don't know that, that uh, my answer is going to be much different. I know it didn't, and I think you're right. All I can say is that it is better, but I think it is hard to pinpoint like when and, and the de like the details, like, um, gosh, it is better. Like, okay, when did that start? It's, that's a hard thing. So I'm just trying to think like, because it would be like, I mean, horrible, horrible fear. And it would steal the joy in my life. Like the, I would have obsessive thinking. So I would be in my backyard having a good time with my kids. And the thought would be, you're going to die. They're going to die. This is temporary. This isn't forever, you know? And you just don't take you, this from me. Yeah. You just say that again, what you just said, cause you, you, you felt you, your Wi-Fi fell off for a second. I just said, I'd be playing outside in the yard with my kids and it, it was always in moments of happiness. And these thoughts in my head would just pop up like, oh, you're happy, Brittany's happy. Okay, you're gonna die. Your kids are gonna die. That, this isn't forever, that's coming. Um, this is just temporary, you know, like all of these, you know, and, I, and it would steal my joy. And it was always in my happy moments. And I kind of just like, First of all, I'm like pissed that anything would steal my joy with my kids or my family or, or any joy in my life, period. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I just, through the things that I do every single day, meditation being one of them, I just think it did. There's For me, there's no other way to describe it except it just got less and less and less. Um and like, sometimes I'll do this, like check-in with myself, like this weird check-in, like, huh, are you still afraid of dying today? You know? Yep. Terrified. Can't do that. Don't want to think about that. But like lately it's just like, no, yeah, like it's not really, you know, my answer to myself would be more like, it's not really at the top of my you know, list today, not really in the front of my brain. No, I'm all right. I'm good. Whereas before it was too much at the top of my list and too much in the front of my brain. And it's all I could think about and it took everything else away from me. So yeah, the analogy I use for that is like, <clears throat> everybody's got an ocean liner. Our mind is an ocean liner. We have a deck. The deck is our mind. And the problem is that most people, especially my higher anxiety students that come to me, the deck is very, it's, it, it's, it's whatever it is, whatever size it is. And then you got all these deck chairs and it's a mess. And some of the deck chairs are broken and whatever, and some are stacked up in this net. I'm not teaching you a technique to rearrange the deck chairs. That's the typical approach that exists in, in, in most meditation techniques, some form of control and manipulation or in Western approach. Let's think about this differently and blah, blah, blah. That does not, that has a positive effect somewhat. But if you don't expand the deck, you're just rearranging the same deck chairs and maybe you rearrange them in a nicer way and you feel temporarily better. But if you don't expand the conscious capacity for mental experience, you don't expand the deck. You're dealing with the same deck and you're just rearranging the stuff in it. So I'm teaching a technique that expands the deck. Then when you start to apply some of these other techniques where you rearrange the deck chairs, it's much easier to do. But also, even if you don't do that, the fears will dissipate anyway because you feel freer. The deck is bigger as if, okay? That's an abstract concept, but that's real. And that's really what's going on. That's where the rubber meets the road. That's where the psychotropic drugs do not, they don't touch that at all. They don't, they don't, they're not expanding your conscious capacity for experience. That's why the Band-Aid effect, you know? So the expansion of the conscious capacity and then the rearrangement of the deck chairs, that's the ideal, that's the ideal formula. So it's not that understanding is irrelevant. It's, but you can't just keep filling the, the limited container of knowledge with, the, with more understanding 
because eventually that container of knowledge bursts and you kind of go, well, I can't get it, you know, it, or it doesn't assimilate or whatever. So expansion of the capacity for mental experience along with more understanding, that's the ideal formula, quite frankly. Did you want to say something, Walker? Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to I, yeah. add, add to that, um, that I guess that's what, when you talk about that, you're, that this expansion that happens from doing this practice consistently, I guess that's what I meant when I said it felt chemical. It wasn't happening here. It was, ha it was, <laughs> it wasn't something that I was, um, intentionally driving into my thought process. It was just a result. So that's what I think that's what I meant when I said it felt chemical. It was just this expansion that was the result. Also, uh, um, something to add to the idea of whatever you focus on expands. Um, I think that's what I was trying to say when I talked about glimpsing it and then building on it. It's like you glimpse this tiny, even if your anxiety reduces by 3%, you focus on that and you're like, oh, how awesome is that? And then, um, and then that 3% becomes 6% because you're focused on that. <laughs> in your so, wake, in your waking state, not during. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Not during the meditation, but right. in your, in your waking state. Right. Um, uh, Donna, I, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but what is your fear of death? I'm just curious, does it come from medical, something specific? Uh, is it was is triggered by something specific? It was um, basically when I was 10, well, I was brought up Catholic. And so there was a lot of kind of hellfire damnation kind of thing at school. And then when I was 10, I just had quite a lot of experiences of death of sort of friends and family and that kind of thing. Mm. No one exceedingly close not parents or brothers or sisters or anything um and then I was taught this prayer about dying and Jesus blessing my soul and I didn't know when or where or how it would happen and all this kind of thing I was taught this prayer when I was 10 and I remember saying it in bed one night and just literally having this realization shit I'm gonna die one day I, and, and this mm. you know because as a 10 year old you don't really think about mortality um, and it just literally gripped me, absolutely gripped me, this terror that one day I wouldn't exist. And I didn't know when that would be or how that would be or whatever. And then that kind of set off like a, I think, I can't really remember that well, but I think for about two or three months, like a, a panic attack, I used to have panic attacks every night, like run up and down the landing in my house, like trying to run away from the fear. Um, and then I bizarrely, um, like put it in a box I thought well I can't solve this myself so I'll wait until 2014 when I'm 40 because I'll be halfway through my life I'll be an adult I'll be able to deal with it and then I just got on with my life and had a mm. perfect normal life and whatever I don't want this to be all about me so I won't go on about it no I'm just and curious then, yeah. yeah and then at 42 I had um quite a lot of other bereavements and then I had a cancer scare and literally mm -hmm. the lid just blew off the box and I just was yeah. like let me die don't let me die don't let me die and I yes. turned it, it turned out to be fine, but it had already set in motion this thing and that I'd sort of subconsciously put a limit of 40 on myself. You know, until I was 40, I was fine. But after 40, I was old. I was closer to dying. And, you know, so since then, I've been sort of on and off with with anxiety and depression and all about getting older and death. And, and I've tried everything, tried absolutely everything. And then I found Calvin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, I didn't know it just keeps being said, and it's probably annoying to hear it if it's not, you know, clicking yet, but it, the, that it's really, the it's the uncertainty thing is so major because I before, after my surgery and I, my remission, you know, well, before all of that, before I started trying to control not being sick again, yeah. I I knew that I was going to have this big surgery, and I knew that there was a possibility that I wouldn't make it. I mean, if someone yeah. rips your liver out of your body. You don't. Not everybody gets through that. So, I ha I remember being wheeled in, and in that moment, um, it was almost it almost became a little bit lighthearted and humorous because 
I knew at that moment it was out of my hands that I was about to be like the IV was in, they were going to put the drugs in me. I was going to be out. The surgery was going to happen. And so I had to get to a place for myself where I had to say, it's, it's out of my hands now. I, Oh, well. And so that's kind of like, I, well, it's like, what, what, what else, what, what else could I do? So I, you know, I was pushed to that. Um, so anyway, I, I bring that up because it's kind of like the meditation has helped me find that again with this new anxiety about, you know, being sick again or remission or what is going on within me that I don't know about, um, this kind of letting go of what I can't control or Mm. yeah. Anyway, I really need to learn. (laughs) Thank you. I think. Jeremy, did you? I want just to- wanted to add, yeah, I just wanted to add something real quick. And Walker mm-hmm. said exactly what I was going to say is it, it's, it's learning to let go. And when, if you, once you've let go, you realize that you don't remember the moment that you let go. Because if you were, in order to remember that moment, you would have had to have been holding on. Does that make sense? Totally. So, yeah. So, like, you don't realize you let go until you've already done it. It's kind of like falling asleep. If you try to fall asleep and you try to think like, I want to, I want to recognize the second that I fall asleep, you'll never fall asleep. There's just at some point, ah, you let go. And then you realize it. it's not so important. Like I could never have imagined telling you that I got over my fear of death and I don't even remember the moment it happened. Like that sounds so ridiculous to me. Like something that consumed my life from the time I was a child till couple years ago to not even know the moment that I got over it. It's like crossing a finish line and some like you're just running and somebody's like, Hey bro, like you, you've been done for 10 minutes. <laughs> you're like, what? Like I've been preparing for this my whole life. But the re that the reality is you just, it's like somebody said, you can't stop running until you let go of the fact that you need to know where the finish line is and then you can stop. Right. So you have to put faith. Sometimes in life we have to put faith in something. I didn't grow up religious. I grew up Christian, but I didn't ever buy into it. So for me, I never understood the concept of faith because I'm like, I have to have the facts. Otherwise I can't believe. Right. Well, sometimes you have to let that go and just put faith in the fact that if you do the things that you're supposed to do, that it'll happen. And that's for me, that's when it happened. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. I I hope it helps. I think that's a big part of it. Anything else, Brittany, you want to wrap up anything? No, um, not really, but um, I don't think I have anything personally that I can add to make it any better. I do think that from my experience, my fear was very intense and I too questioned like, will I ever feel better? Will I ever? And again, for me, the answer was absolutely. And my life today, my life that I'm living, you know, three years after starting meditation, but also going down all kinds of roads of wellness and treatments and things, you know, this has been the best three years of that I've ever had. So, and it is enjoyable and I don't fear um, certain things that I used to. So I just think have faith, like Jeremy said, have hope, and yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Brittany. Yeah, it's the consistency of the practice that's important because the consistency builds, it's cumulative. It's cumulative. It's cumulative. It's cumulative. And if you think about it just from a parasympathetic nervous system standpoint, we are training the parasympathetic to turn on regularly twice a day. <clears throat> and it needs reminder. It needs to be reminded. We don't need to be reminded how to turn on the fight or flight. Unfortunately, we, we, we've been reminded of that way too much, most of us in our lives. And then just turn, you know, stop watching so much TV because that'll just do it. I mean, the news part of the TV, movies, you know, it's okay. But the news is just, ugh, it's too much, you know, fight or flight all the time. In order to keep the advertising budget going, they want to create fear and anxiety. 
You know, people get hooked into that. Like Jeremy kind of alluded to this point, the adrenaline buzz. I'm not, I'm not saying that you are enjoying this experience, Donna, but, but there, you know, we know people in life, maybe we have been that person at times, the adrenaline buzz from a scary movie. Why do you think people, some people love scary movies, you know? It's the adrenaline fix, you know, and they get a juice from it. Well, that that kind of over-triggering of the nervous system needs to be balanced. And so the consistency of turning on the reverse of that, the parasympathetic, the opposite of the fight or flight on a regular basis, which is what this simple technique that I teach does, it, 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 that's what restores the balance, but it's gradual. It's little by little, as you've heard the panelists say today, it's little by little by little. And Jeremy just articulated it so well, you don't know what you don't know when doing it, it's not happening anymore. It's just by definition, it's a catch 22. But, but from my standpoint, as somebody who's helping people overcome their anxieties, whether they be about fear of death or anything else, uh, it, it we don't I don't care. we don't care we're not we're not, it's not a it's not a you know we don't have to keep a whoa that date is the special date no I care about getting rid of you helping you guys get rid of it and whenever that happens and if it takes two weeks two months two years I don't care how long it takes I stick with you guys as you guys know right and I help you through that get you through that point however long that takes and everybody's different everybody's chemistry is, and life is different is unique so um if you're curious those people are watching the the recording um uh i'm teaching you know i have an august classes coming up you can see it on my website turningwithin.org you can go to the register page and that's where you can always see when my next classes are um but i teach these on an ongoing basis um every month and um you know, I teach private classes sometimes to families and uh, organizations, et cetera. But um, just reach out to me. Um, you have my website, turningwithin.org. Go to the contact page, reach out to me. I hope this has been helpful for folks. Um, whether you have anxiety or not, or whether you know uh, family members who have anxiety, very often I'll get contacted by loved ones. Just recently that happened. Um, you know, who are concerned about their loved ones who are highly anxious, etc. And so if you're one of those concerned loved ones, feel free to reach out to me privately, etc. And we'll set up a, I always do a free phone conversation with everybody, anybody in the world. I'm, I work with people in 48 countries now, helping them dealing with this and any other issues that they may have going on. Um, and it's always free. First phone call with me, phone session. Um, it's all part of my nonprofit work that I do full time now. So thanks for joining us today. And thank you, especially to Brittany and Jeremy and Walker for sharing their stories with us can so candidly and their insights and their suggestions and advice and uh, how 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 they have progressed to the points where they've overcome their anxiety, uh, you know, now and can move on with their lives in whatever way that they feel feel uh, feel appropriate in a, in a more enjoyable, more contented way. So that's the goal. That's the goal. It's always the goal in everything that I do. Okay. Thank you so much. Great to see everybody. And thank uh, you, Cal. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. You thank all. you. Thanks, Jeremy. See you, Brittany. Thank you so much. Take care, everybody.